so lovely people. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wigmore Hall for the launch of this incredible new book celebrating 26 women who have made a significant contribution, 26 black women who have made a significant contribution to the music industry. And joining me now is the book's author, harpsichordist, Leslie Kwan. Let's give her a big round of applause. Okay, Leslie, before we jump into the fabulous new book, A is for Aretha, which is here. Great book. <laughs> It would be really great to just get to know you a little bit better. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> and before we hear about your journey to where we are now, to the creation of this book, I think a really nice icebreaker is, um, Leslie, tell us something about yourself that nobody knows. My mom's going to not be happy about this. Um, <laughs> I love to watch um, The Real Housewives of New York. <laughs> it's a brain dump for me. I don't have to think about it. You know, it's just kind of gets me to stop thinking about things when I have a lot going on in my head, so sorry, Mom. <laughs> so I think most pressing um, is to find out how you first got started in music, and more specifically, actually, classical music. Well, like a lot of these women, I love music, and my mother said I just loved playing with my fingers, going like this all the time, but I played in the church, you know, on a little Allen organ, um, and... It just was something that I just felt the most safe in. And I think a lot of people feel safe when it comes to music. So I was very blessed, well, still blessed. My mother says I'm still blessed. Um, <laughs> to have parents who supported my desire to play and to just take it and see where it could go. So that started at a very young age. I think I was four years old when I started to play for the first time. And was it piano you said? And it was piano, constantly going like this. So how did you find your way to harpsichord because, I mean, actually we don't see many women harpsichordists full stop, but to see a black woman harpsichord, I mean. Yes, I get told that a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd want to say it's probably like this. I always knew I loved music and I loved the piano, but I didn't feel at home there, oddly enough. So it wasn't until I heard a recording by Trevor Pinnock, British harpsichordist, I think it was the double violin concerto of Bach, and I heard that recording, and I just felt like I'd come home. It just felt like my sonic home. It might also be because it's a half step lower, which is another detail, but it just felt right. And my mother, again, sharing that news with her that I fell in love with the harpsichord, she said, well, that's lovely to hear, but you're going to buy your own harpsichord. <laughs> so... And you already own two pianos. Is that and I already right? owned two pianos, <laughs> and I already had a viola, so my parents more than did their duty. It was an investment on their end, but it's one that um, I'm really grateful for. So you've got a really interesting journey throughout your professional career. I mean, you've worked in fashion, you've worked in media and marketing. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, the fashion side was a, out of a necessity. I was married at the time, and... I need to find a job. My former husband got laid off from his job, and I was working on my doctorate at Stony Brook and living in Boston. So there was this posting for the Chanel boutique <laughs> of all brands, right? Because that's what you do when you're working in school. You decide to go for the biggest luxury brand company in the world. <laughs> and um, this posting was for sales, and I didn't have a, a CV. I was a professional, professional student, if anything. So. Um, my husband put on the CV and put it all together. I got dressed in my best black daytime outfit to go to this and interview. At, and at this point, you were, you were performing, weren't you? I was you just were... studying. I was a housewife and I was studying. And it's completely different. Completely our, different. Our, 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 and our CVs as musicians yeah. are entirely different to yeah. what real people need a CV for. Isn't yes, it? so that was quite daunting. But um, I think being a performer helped me go in and apply for the job. I was able to talk to this glamorous woman dressed in the most beautiful outfit. And uh, I, I just told her, I said, I need a job. <laughs> My husband got laid off. I need to work. And she said, well, what sales experience do you have? And I said, well, I worked at Banana Republic for maybe three months. <laughs> and, and I had worked the year before at Yolanda's 
bridal salon in Waltham so I can get my wedding dress on discount. So <laughs> Yolanda knows this, so she, she's well aware of this. Um, so, yeah, my experience was very, very different. Luxury is a completely different world. You have, well, first of all, things are so expensive, but as a salesperson, there's no salary. It's 100% commission. Right, that was my, the look my husband gave me. He was like, so if you don't sell anything, you don't make any money. Um, but it was one of the best chapters of my life, I have to say. How long were you there for? Eight years. So uh, the other detail about working for a luxury brand like that, there's a minimum of sales that you have to do, and it was a million, <laughs> a million dollars. And I just thought, I don't, I, I have to do it. I don't have an option. Did you, did you make it? Did you make I did 1.1 million my first year. <laughs> so by the time I left, uh, eight years later, I was almost at 2 million. And they were very unhappy that I was going to leave. That's money I can't even have. <laughs> and then, so what, where, where did you go? You just finished studying. You were in Chanel. And then where did you go after that? And you got your doctorate as well, that's correct. Well, I, I, didn't, I also didn't finish that, which was kind of hard to do, you know, full-time sales and this amazing job. But um, there was a, a sad chapter during that time, and that was my mother was diagnosed with cancer. She's still with us, but at that time, that's when she was diagnosed. So during that journey at Chanel, um, I just remember thinking, there's got to be a way for me to incorporate what I'm learning with this business and with music. And I discovered that when she listened to, when my mother listened to live recordings, her energy would change. And I thought, well, if I could, if I could bring musicians into a hospital, that would be really cool. I had no idea, again, what that would look like. So fast forward a couple years later, when she went into remission, I had this idea of launching a chamber of music series at the local hospital in Boston, which is Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So, um, again, another random event, but maybe not so random. I was performing at someone's home, and the guests were these two doctors, friends of the president at Dana-Farber, and they said, oh, you just need to talk to Ed. Who's Ed? He's the president of Dana-Farber. You'll have a conversation, and it'll be fine. And it was literally like that. 20 minutes later, <laughs> I had his phone number. We spoke the next day. Three weeks later, I pitched in front of his entire senior team, and I just thought, what am I doing? I've never, <laughs> I have no idea what this is. But it was all with the intention of using music to make people feel better. So the first concert was December 14th, 2012. And I'd put together a beautiful Christmas program. So French carols, English carols. I brought my harpsichord. I slept that into the lobby with about 15, no, well, there's 15 of us total, but about 15 pieces of music. And I just thought, I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to sit and play and... We started to play, and the entire lobby went silent. Um, there were about 80 patients. It gets me very emotional to think about it. But when it was over, everyone just looked like they were transformed, and I thought, well, I don't need to perform anymore. I could just do this. It just made me so happy to see people so at peace. So where to next, then? Where to after music? <clears throat> well, um, so my, my, I, I launched my own Baroque Orchestra, Another thing that you don't do when you're going through a seismic life chapter is while you're getting divorced is to start an orchestra. I decided to do that because, you know, where do you channel your pain? So I just decided I'll do something I've never done before. So I was working at Chanel, still full time, and I went to Harvard Music Library and taught myself how to start a nonprofit. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> but when I launched the, the orchestra, um, we were specializing in French Baroque music, and I love the French, Chanel, obviously. <laughs> so it was, it was a really wonderful way for me to step my own like, position in the community in Boston to figure out, well, what does Leslie represent? What's her legacy? Um, and so that's how I started the orchestra. And then uh, the, the chamber series at the hospital was a few years later. Doing the Chamber Series was really fantastic. It was supposed to be once a month, and then it turned into once a week. And then we were there for three years in a row at Dana-Farber, 
Then we moved into Mass General Hospital into their neonatal unit, so playing for the premature babies. <laughs> it, it was just such a magical time. And unbeknownst to me, um, Boston Symphony Orchestra was paying attention to my work. And as a former violist, it's a huge job. <laughs> so I, when they approached me in, I think it was 2013, and said they wanted to sponsor a bunch of concerts. I just thought, I don't know what this is happening, what it means, but yes, please, thank you very much for this gift. And they did it for two years. And by 2015, um, they, we had another meeting to discuss, you know, branching into other hospitals. And that's when the then uh, marketing officer, Kim Knoll, to me, she said, um, well, we've got this position that we've created and we'd love for you to come, <laughs> come work for us. I still, you know, it still bewilders me that that actually happened. And I said, well, I'm not a marketer. I'm a performer first and foremost, so. But it was a storytelling element ultimately that won them over, that I just used the heart of what was happening in those hospitals as a story. So they, they created this position. I was AD of marketing for them for a year. It was, it was just for a year, but um, probably one of the best years of my life. It just changed everything for me to understand what it meant to present these stories for one of the top orchestras in the world. And, and who doesn't want to go to classical music concerts whenever you can? Mm. Um, and our concerts were th three days a week, so it was very busy. <laughs> and all this time you're still playing harpsichord, is that right? No, well, I couldn't. There wasn't, there wasn't time. But by this point, when I was presenting at hospitals, it was quite di different. I wasn't performing anymore. I was organizing the entire thing. So and that takes a lot. Entirely. I totally sidestepped. But I also realized, too, that it was, a, it was a side of myself that I didn't know existed, that I didn't mind not being on stage, because I was more interested in seeing how happy the patients were and the staff were. So when did you know that you wanted to, to make that move from performance to entirely other things? music related? Well, it was so organic. You know, I just... Presenting for patients in a hospital is not the same presenting in a stage like this. Um, one of my colleagues asked me, when I asked him to perform one day, he said, well, do I need to put together a music program? What, you know, what do I need to tell them? Do they need to learn about this composer? And I said, well, they've just learned that they have cancer pretty life-changing. We just need to make them feel better. And that's all I wanted to do, was to make people feel better. Um, and, and that also kind of resonated with the book as well, because these women, it was just about making people feel better with music. So I think the moment when we gave the first Christmas concert, that's when it shifted for me. But it wasn't, it wasn't a hard stop, I'm never going to perform again. It was, this is just an extension of what I'm doing. Um, I, I don't like to limit myself. <laughs> Clearly, this is the case. <laughs> I don't like to limit myself in that regard. So I just thought, you know, this is where I'm being guided, and it feels right. Because some musicians are very. We were talking before you and I, weren't we, about how tunnel vision a lot of musicians are, and they just want to perform, mm -hmm. um, which I think is great, you know, and they really focus. But you have such a a plethora of, of talents that you've picked up along the way. Um, and, and I guess a big part of that as well is social justice within classical music. How, how have you navigated towards that before we get to the book? Before we even? get to the book. Um, well, I'm a black woman, <laughs> so if that's not evident. Um, so. But I never thought about myself as a, as that, a black, black woman. I'm a woman, I'm a musician. So it just struck me that when people would start to say, oh, but you're a black harpsichordist. The first time that happened was at a festival in Berkeley, I think in 2008 or nine, and this woman came up to me and said, I've never heard a black harpsichordist before. I've never been told <laughs> I've never been told that they've never heard a black harpsichordist before. So I remember looking at her and saying, well, did it sound different? 
I was just so puzzled. It just, I, I didn't understand what was the big deal, you know, because it's such a natural way for me to be. Music is just who, who I am. Do you so, think it's a big deal now? I mean, it's not a big deal to me. I think it's a big deal to other people. Mm. And I understand it is a big deal for um, kids who love this music but don't see themselves. Mm. But I, I was, I'm really blessed. I have incredible parents and lots of aunts and uncles <laughs> who, um, who told us as kids that we could just do what, whatever we wanted. Um, there wasn't anything that we set our sights to that was not achievable. It might be hard work, but, and my mother, again, we invested in your education, so <laughs> you're gonna make sure, make sure that works, but um, I never thought that I couldn't do something unless I really felt it was outside of what I felt what was possible for me personally because of a technicality. But no, I just went with it. So, on to your book now. Yes. Your incredible book. It's called A is for Aretha, mm -hmm. with illustrations by Rachel Baker. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you'd read a little bit from it for us. Oh, okay. We've got it right here. Go sure. on. Sure, thank you. I'm going to sit back and Put on this. my best church Bible reading. So I'll start with Aretha Franklin first. A is for Aretha Franklin. She taught us how to command respect for ourselves. Her powerful number one song, Respect, was an anthem for a generation of civil rights activists who demanded equality and justice for all Americans. I'll go in order. It's a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, next is B is for Billie Holiday, known for her soulful voice and rendition of the song Strange Fruit, which directly addressed lynchings, a violent act of American racism. She is celebrated as having been one of the first artists to use popular music to speak out against injustice. And one of my favorites, C is for Shaka Khan, a songwriter and performer who pushed racial boundaries by singing with an integrated band. She also joined the Black Panthers, a revolutionary civil rights group whose community outreach included a free breakfast program for hungry kids. Thanks very much, Leslie. So Leslie, give us an overview of the book. What's it about, who it's for, what was your inspiration for it? The inspiration. My youngest niece, Daphne. Um, at the time, she was four years old, because I, I started to sketch this out a couple years ago, before COVID. And, um, She's the youngest. I hope there's no one that's not an issue for anybody in that regard. So she was being quite sassy with, with her youngest, with her older brother, Dylan. And I said, Daphne, you need to respect your older brother. Respect, Auntie Leslie, respect. And I started to sing. I'm not going to sing for you, sorry. Um, <laughs> I started to sing the song Respect by Aretha. And so we were running around the house singing this song together. And I thought, huh, that'd be a cute little book. A is for Aretha. Go on Google. Thank God for Google. Research it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. There were a, a few books out there, but I was looking for a primer. I thought, well, this is kind of cool. It'd be nice to have a primer about the black women who created these different genres of music. Um, and I couldn't find any. And then I panicked. I immediately had this sinking feeling in my heart that, oh boy, it's not written. And I knew that once I got an idea in my head, it was not going to leave. So for two weeks, I would wake up and research it, and my mother would ask me, what are you looking for? Like, what? And I said, I, I, I think this book exists, Mom. It, it has to be out there. And she said, well, you didn't see it two weeks ago. It's still the same problem. It doesn't exist. And she said, so just write it. Maya Angelou's an author. She's a writer. Jane Austen, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> really serious writers. And she said, Leslie, it's a children's book. It should be easy for you to put together. And I know you have a title. What's the title? I said, A is for Aretha. And she goes, great, just sketch it. So I sketched it. 
in two weeks. And um, it was right before I was moving to London. So it was in August of 2019. I was in New York City. And I thought, OK, I'm going to take a leap and share it with a friend of mine, this wonderful um, author, Lindy, Lindsay Tremata. She lives in Paris, American in Paris. And I sent it to her, and she said, oh, this is really quite charming. Let me send it to a friend of mine. She didn't tell me she was sending it to her agent. <laughs> so her agent immediately wrote back and said, I'd love to meet you before you leave for London. So I met with her August 29th, 2019, and she signed me that day. And I can't even begin to tell you. I, I just thought, I don't know what this means, but we'll try it. So we worked on the book together that year. Then COVID hit. We won't talk about COVID. Um, but during that time, it was really quite nice to have the brain space to just let it germinate a little bit more. And in August of 2020, my agent's name is Judy, she start, started to pitch it out to different publishing houses. And this one particular publishing house publisher kept coming back named Coquila. And I said, who's Coquila? And she said, they're with Penguin Random House. And then I, then I, then I had a moment. I did a little bit of a scream dance around my desk for about two minutes. <laughs> we had our meeting on September 11th, 2020, and that's when they offered me a contract. And then that's when the real revision started because working with a publishing house you have to make sure that you know, the copy is correct, that the language is correct. And so we you know, wordsmithed it together a little bit. But the research, the real research behind it was to focus on the music these women brought together, but also their activism. So for me, it, went, it meant going back into all of their stories, you know, civil rights movement, today, modern day, and just what it means to be a black woman in, in music pop music specifically. And I'm a harpsichordist. Um, so, I mean, American pop music was my soundtrack as a kid, but you know, I'm, mentally I'm still, still in the Baroque world. So it took me some time to really dive in and understand what these women went through. And then that was a very illuminating period. Uh, perfect example in talking about Billie Holiday. Strange Fruit was the song that we selected. And I remember talking with my editor, and we discussed whether or not to include the word lynchings and why that was important. And I kept thinking, I don't know if I could talk to Daphne about lynchings. But you know, the thing about racism, it doesn't matter how old you are, right? So you can experience racism as an infant, as a baby, as a five-year-old. It doesn't matter what your age is. So I had to think about that. And it made me realize it was important to talk about the racism and to talk about, about it at a young age so that the kids understand, you know, when they're five, six, seven, and they begin to really under, to understand words in that sense, um, that these women, for all that they did music, they, they overcame a lot of things when it came to racism. And so it would provide a little bit of a founda foundation, if you will, in that regard. So it, it took about a good year of doing that research and also fact-checking like crazy <laughs> to make sure it was all accurate. But in the end, um, this was the result. And I'm, I'm just so pleased because, uh, again, it was something I never have done before. And I feel really proud. And I hope that the women who are living really enjoy it. You should be really proud of it. It's an incredible <laughs> book. Um, who is it for? Who is it for in the wider world? Well, it's for me. Um, like my heart, you know, when I think about when I was five years old and wishing I had a book like this as a little girl, we had Winnie the Pooh. Um, I mean, nothing wrong against Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> um, you know, but um, any of the, Dr. Seuss, but any of the books to kind of like everything else, having a doll that looks like you. Um, as a classical musician, I went to LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts, which was a feat with it in itself. And I remember the few times we had musicians come through. Out of the years that I was there, I think maybe only three black musicians came through. And they were jazz musicians. So. 
I thought, if I wanted to change into pop music, I had examples that looked like me. But if I had classical music, I didn't have examples. And I thought, well, pop music, though, is the culture. That's global. And even though I'm a classical musician, I still love pop music. And many of these women start off as classical musicians, but they went into pop. So I thought, there's no point in separating the two, because they all feed into each other, ultimately. I mean, it shows just how important the foundation of classical music is for all types of music, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the illustrations. Who's done them? Because they are <coughs> the, the book. By the way, it's an absolutely beautiful book, hard, hardback book. Um, really nice to thumb through. I think what I really enjoy, particularly about this book as well, is the fact that it's clearly aimed at children. But thumbing through, um, there's so much that I didn't know about some of these women as well. I forgot to mention that, so I'll, I'll address that now. Um, so in terms of the, the copy itself, um, you know, there were women in here I didn't know their stories about, and I thought it was important. So it's for, I guess, musicians of all ages. Um, if you love music, or if you don't like music, but you like women's history, uh, I just felt that it was important to have that backstory in there so that the adult or teenager or young person who loved the book, because it, 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 it's marketed for children, you know, babies to age three or four. But I think what I imagined was, um, you know, if Daphne was two years old and learning how to really read, she would say A is for Aretha, B is for Billy, C, you know. And, and then as she got older, she can really take in the copy that's in there and understand why Auntie Leslie, what is racism? Like, what does this mean? What is the civil rights movement? And to create that dialogue on a foundational level as a kid through the lens of music. And I asked you about the illustrations as so well. So the Who's illustrations, Rochelle Baker is, I feel so blessed to have um, her. The um, publishers at Penguin, they were really qu quite passionate about her work. And we had one Zoom, one. And it was astonishing, because I was here in London, she's in Detroit, and the publishers are all in New York, and my agent's in, the, in, in New York. We did this one Zoom, and we talked about colors, um, the kind of energy I wanted to have coming off the page, but more, most importantly, was how the women looked. I wanted them to look like themselves, so that any child or adult picking up this book would say, that's definitely Aretha Franklin, or that's definitely Patti LaBelle. And I, she captured it. It's just mind-boggling. She's, she's amazing. I'm, I'm really lucky that we got to work with her. I really want to know, how did you pick which oh artist would be which letter? That was really hard, really hard. Um, so when I first wrote the book, actually, I had three artists per letter, which made it a little bit easier to include, you know, Beyonce and Anita Baker and... Um, but I was advised that for a primer, it has to be one letter. Otherwise, for children learning, it'd be too complicated. So I, someone asked me, well, you didn't put Beyonce in there. I said, well, if it weren't for Billy, there wouldn't be Beyonce. No offense. So it was important to really think about the foundational women. I mean, granted, um, in terms of the letter L, for example. Lizzo isn't foundational in that sense as someone that started a genre of music, but she's foundational in how she uses her platform for voting rights and identity and so forth. So, so she's an inspiration. She's an inspiration, very strong inspirations. Because uh, I said to you before, didn't I, I turned to T. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, the letter I was... T was... I originally had, yeah, I had many friends say, you didn't put I Tina Turner in there, you should be banished. Um, however, 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 there's a really good story for why I choose, chose Tina Bell. Um, so Tina Bell, I knew nothing about her. I grew up liking grunge music. Didn't know that there were bl black people, duh, in playing grunge music. And so when I, when I learned about her, it just hit home really hard. Tina Bell, um, she, her birthday's next month, actually, born in 1957, a black woman, and uh, she had a band with her husband, who was a white American, who uh, it li lived in Seattle, and their group was called Bam Bam. And they were pretty much the starting sound of what is no known as grunge. 
So Kurt Cobain, all those guys would go out and listen to her sex. But racism. Um, the white managers, music managers, wouldn't promote a mixed race band that was fronted by a black woman. So you can imagine that had a horrible impact on her heart. Um, she faced neo-Nazis coming into her set sometimes. And I think eventually she picked up and moved to Europe, sounds familiar, um, <laughs> for a little bit, and then went back home and died, I believe, um, in, in 2012, I believe. But she, she, had, she had one son, one child, T.J. Martin, and he, he's a Hollywood director. And um, I learned that he was still alive. So I decided I'm going to send him a message through Instagram. And that's how I got in touch with him. And he was the one that told me that when his mother died, it was about, I think, she'd been passed away in her apartment for maybe a week or two weeks. Um, and when they discovered her, um, the management for the apartment building complex, you know, obviously she was taken away, but then all of her stuff, records, journals, music programs, recordings, all thrown away. So when he arrived the day after he was told that she died, I think there might have been like, I don't know, like a hanger, Nothing consequential for him to take to commemorate his mother. So that hit home for me. It was just like a physical erasing of this woman. And I then felt I had to tell her story. Especially as a musician, I also didn't know about her. I figured, oh, I didn't know about her. There were plenty of other people who didn't know about her. So we had a lovely, he lives in LA, so we had a lovely like three hour Zoom call and I, I said, I'm working on this book. Can I get your permission to write this book? And he said, well, there hasn't been anything written about her um, besides articles now. So he said yes, and so we worked on the copy together. And that's what's in the book now. I think that's what's really beautiful about the book is that within the book, you'll see artists that you know and you recognize. You'll find out things about those artists that you know that you didn't know before, but there's also these unsung heroes, yeah. these women who actually open the door for so many people yeah. that we know very well today. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, to, what I really liked about the, the T1 in particular is, um, obviously, Tina Turner is... is uh, Evergreen. <laughs> uh, you know, for rock music, but to, to platform and celebrate an artist in a genre mm. where we don't usually see ourselves, I think that's what's really fantastic about this book. Mm. Is there anything else that you found out during the creation of this book that you think was, was a real surprise, or either actually about the women that you wrote about or in the whole process itself? Writing a children's book is hard. <laughs> You know, when you, when you write copy for an organization or a company, it's very different. It's very adult. Um, and so I found myself kind of going into my adult language. I actually got a bit academic, so we had to whittle that down. Um, it's like poetry. So they kept telling me, just think about it as poetry. 50 words. And I thought, 50 words, my god. OK. And then again, to put in all of the information that I felt was important in just 50 words, make it accessible enough, but still have the impact and um, make the point. So that, that was, the, that was the, the biggest surprise. Um, not, that I, not that I assumed it'd be easy, but it, I definitely didn't think it would take the time that it did. And again, the research, I was really glad all my years of being a professional student um, <laughs> paid off because I could sit and read for hours about these women. I'm going to ask you to read another excerpt, if that's oh, all right. Sure. I'm going to ask you to read X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay. they're three artists. I think they're three letters that people might struggle to find, mm. a black female artist. Yeah, sure. OK. X is for Ziamara Alfaro, famous Cuban singer 
whose acting ability provided opportunities for her to perform around the world, from Carnegie Hall in New York to the Moulin Rouge in Paris. At the time of her performances, those venues mostly hosted white musicians. Why is for Yolanda, uh, Yolanda Adams, excuse me, the first person to win the American Music Award for Contemporary Gospel Artist? She believes that music can help people change their lives and uses her talent to support charities that fight childhood cancer and protect people from domestic violence. And my favorite is Zoe. Z is for Zoe Wees the sensational songwriter from Germany. Zoe uses the healing power of music to help manage a rare form of epilepsy that sometimes leaves her feeling anxious. Her debut single, Control, charted in several nations. That's incredible, thank you. So a lack of black women in the spotlight is a driving force behind this book. Uh, women not getting the recognition they deserve. So how can books like this help to bridge the gap? Well, I felt that, you know, the world is so much in flux, and with music it's even more so. And kind of like the movie Hidden Figures of black women in space and engineering, I felt it was important to me that this book existed so that people would remember who created these different genres of music or help shape the different genres of music. So I feel, if anything, regardless of age, it'll be easy for people to read and understand and to carry forward, you know, to make sure that their story is still part of history, living history. Because every time you hear a song, um, it's, it's them, it's their voice, it's their contribution to world history. Were there any artists that you researched th whose stories really resonated with you? Nina Simone's did quite a bit. In what me. way? Well, pianist, classical music. She picked up and moved to Paris for a period, which I did. Um, she was misunderstood in a lot of different ways. Specific, a lot to do with her activism. A as well, lot to do it? with her activism too, and and her activism came through experiences as a as a small child, um, you know, seeing her parents being pushed to the back of a of a concert hall because they were black, and her her refusal at that age to be like, nope, I'm not playing until my parents come up to the front. Um, I didn't have experiences like that. Most of the racism I experienced was as an adult, has been as an adult. Uh, so I felt we were quite similar in that way. And that we use our music, uh, Nina has and I ha have used my music to help shape the conversations when it comes to addressing racism. What do you hope young readers will recognize and understand by the end of A is for Aretha? Could you, sorry. What do you hope young readers will recognize and understand mm -hmm. by the end of that book? Well, that black women are awesome. <laughs> 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 that, we, that we basically lay the foundation for so much that we hold dear and don't realize actually started with us. Um, and that, you know, so I started off as a performer, but I didn't know there were jobs for black musicians in the administrative side of orchestras. I didn't know that you could write a, a, ch a children's book about, about music. I didn't know that you could run an orchestra. I mean, I didn't have examples of that. I found it all out on my own because I just wanted to do it. So I hope that children look at this book and see themselves, that there are different ways of occupying different roles in music and that you could use things that you're passionate about any kind of activism and have your music serve as that platform and, and to be proud of that and different genres as well I think, and different genres you can do it all i mean i'm not usually mistaken as a harpsichordist by the way i always get asked oh so what's your voice type um <laughs> which maybe i should come back as a singer but 
right now, um, the harpsichord is where my heart is. What's your vision for the future of music, and how do you want to impact the industry specifically through your writing? Well, that's a big question. That's a massive... Let's break it down. What's your vision for the future of music? <laughs> my vision for the future of music is that we can just celebrate who we are as we are and without having to pigeonhole, well, you need to do it because of your, your this you know, race or culture or you're this orientation. Um, music doesn't discriminate. So why are we making, why, you know, I think the construct, and that's a whole other conversation when it comes to white supremacy uh, and music, it just complicates things. And it just feels so unnecessary. When I sit down and I play a piece of music or I'm organizing uh, a chamber music series or I'm writing copy for an orchestra, I'm just thinking about the impact of the music. I'm not thinking about, okay, you're Chinese, you're black, you're Dutch. What's gonna cater to you? Because quite frankly, you probably eat food from different cultures, you listen to music from different cultures, you, you wear clothes from different, you know, so I just thought, it's global. Let's just write it so that it makes sense from a storytelling perspective of, you know, it's, it's, it's beauty in oral form, that's music. And who doesn't like beautiful things? So it might be a bit simplistic to put it that way, but it hasn't served me wrong so far in my career. So I think that's the way that I lead with it. We've been talking about beautiful things all morning. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them the story when you got lost in, in the... Uh... Oh, so yes, God. Um, Mom. I was five years old or six years old. My maternal grandmother would take us shopping for school clothes and my first time going, they lost me. And one woman in the store knew my grandmother and said, Miss Doris, your daughter's in the fur, your granddaughter's in the fur department. <laughs> and I was found standing, you know, mouth agape, hands behind my back, staring at a skin on skin sable for like $20,000. <laughs> Coincidentally, the most expensive item in the show. <laughs> so my grandmother said, and she looked at my mother, and she said, that's your daughter. <laughs> and they keep saying they don't know where I came from, but I've always gravitated to the most expensive thing in the room. So when I got the job at Chanel, it made complete sense to everybody. <laughs> because, I mean, well, and tying that in, <clears throat> for the end of me leaving Chanel, I should share that story. Um, so I had just finished my review in 2011, March 2011, um, for my sales at Chanel that, that, that quarter. I got a great review, my bonus. Um, and I remember coming down the stairs, standing in the cosmetics section, and looking out at the st store and thinking, I'm done. <laughs> and it wasn't like anyone had done anything to make me upset. I just had this realization. My work here is done. So when I shared the news, I thought about it for a couple of days before, and what I finally told my director, she, she was stunned because I was almost grossing two million a year for them in sales. So that's a big loss if I were to leave. And um, I told them, and then she shared it with the corporate office in New York, and the president of, uh, of the US stores called me at the store. And she said, I heard you're leaving. Is there anything, like, what, what can we do? And I said, no, 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 it's totally fine. And she said, well, is it your music stuff? Because we, we, we can make that my music stuff. <laughs> <laughs> As if, you know? Um, and because I was running my orchestra by this point, so it wasn't like they didn't know. But it wasn't, it definitely didn't have an impact on my sales. I was still doing that. Um, and I said, no, Jessica, it's not my music stuff. Um, and she said, well, just promise me one thing. Just tell me. Promise me you're not going to Hermes. <laughs> Is this that scarf you've got around you? I have an Hermes scarf. <laughs> and I said, that's the biggest compliment you can give me. I'm not going to Hermes. I am just taking a break. Um, back to the book. What is, yeah. What's the impact you want it to have on the industry? What impact do you want to have with your writing? Well, on the music industry. when we were talking about, when I was talking about the book uh, with my publisher and my agent, I said, I want this to be in every venue that's 
like has classical music, because it's important for people to see that these women also had a, you know, part of their music training and background in classical music. Um, just so that it's not just through the lens of, okay, we need to have a classical music, classical musician that's black. It, that it, it opens the doors for them to see that there's, there's more to what's out there. Um, and that's just part of the dialogue, you know? If we could talk about classical music, we could talk about pop music, and the two th things work together. They really do, if you think about programming these days. It's not just, you know, no offense to Bach, but it's not just Bach, Bach, Bach. You know, you'll have Bach, you'll have a contemporary composer. I'd like to see, you know, a lot more orchestras are doing pop programs where they have Jennifer Hudson, for example, going up on stage and singing classics. So I, I just think it just needs to be part of the part of the programming, part of the language, part of their foundation. I'm really keen that we leave a bit of time for any questions. Yes. Uh, but I've got a few more questions for you. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, as, as visible black people in, in, in any type of music, actually, I was going to yeah. say classical music, but actually in any type of music, and your book really proves that. Um, we're all activists in a way. Mm -hmm. But what role does music play in bringing about social justice? I mean, just singing and hearing the music is enough for, for you to, to just feel like you should do something, you know? Um, that's the thing that really struck home for me, uh, say, for Mahalia Jackson. I mean, she, she was the voice of the civil rights movement. And you can't listen to her music now without thinking about that time in terms of history. And it's still, it's still relevant today. Uh, so, to me, it's, it's about having a musical activism, you know, that you, you, you can have it in your head, listening to it through your, your, your headphones, you can listen to it and still feel that activism if you're at home, if you're in the classroom, you know, it, 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 it goes with you in that way. I don't know if I answered that properly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're looking confused, so I'm sorry if I didn't. Um. What's the resonation? What's excuse me? What's the resonance of publications like this in the wider community? Do you think? Well, music history is global history, is world history, it's American history, so it's all part of the history that we have. So I don't think it can just sit on the shelf of uh, a music library. Uh, just the fashion that's in the book. That was so much fun, choosing the pictures of what these women wear. That's part of history. Uh, what instruments they play is part of history. So I, I feel that it could branch out and you know, have an impact on all those sectors and the conversations around activism and history through those lens. What's next? What's next? Um, <laughs> Well, we've got the first book out. Where are we going? I've got the this? first book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, I've had questions. Can I? Sh I guess I could share a couple of those questions. You know, um, writing the book, I just thought, oh, this will be a cool book. But then I, I met someone who said, well, it could be a great animated short. And I thought, moving Aretha Franklin, <laughs> I guess for Aretha, you know, through the lens of a child, or it could be a play. It could be many different things, you know, and so that was really exciting to me. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to get back to playing a little bit, but I'd like to also explore this option. So, I don't there's know. There's no reason you can't do there's, Well, there's no reason I can't, well, but you know as a, as a professional musician, you know, you, you, you have to still put in the groundwork. You still have to practice. Um, I, haven't, I haven't practiced in a little bit. <laughs> um, but I think that the um, opportunities that come from this book are really exciting. And I'm, I think having launched my own Baroque orchestra and having that behind the scenes experience, that excites me. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, we've got about 10 minutes left and I'd love to hear any questions from anybody in the audience for Leslie. Has anybody got any questions? We haven't got a roving mic, so you'll have to shout really nice and loud. Anybody at all? Yeah, go on. Oh, favorite protest songs. I think because my grandmother sang it to me all the time as a kid, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's a protest song in that sense, but it is, and that's We Shall Overcome. 
I'm not going to sing it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone, if anyone knows this song, um, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a real classic in that sense. And um, I think it speaks to the black church a lot. It speaks to the black community, um, overcoming obstacles, you know, racism, for example. Um, it's something that she would always sing um, when she was f feeling a certain way. And it's always kind of reminded me of her, but also reminded me that when I, I have hurdles, that I can overcome that. Um, I think that's a perfect example of what you were talking about before in terms of music and its inextricable link mm. to social justice and how those messages, we absorb them just by listening. Yeah. You know, and it's proved to be, for you, mm -hmm. a, a way for you to, to keep going whenever you, you, you face an obstacle. Yeah. Has anybody else got any questions? Front. Just your opinion on today's music, really. You've got things like grime and loads of stuff that my, I don't really understand what they're saying. <laughs> oh, I don't either, but... Um, <laughs> Well, if the beat's good, I'm fine. <laughs> I think that's the simplest way to put it. I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's I find that the, the I, I guess because these women are older and I grew up with that, it feels more like home. But I, I, like I said, if the beat is good, I may not understand the words, but if I can still sit and bop in my car or at home or at the kitchen, um, I don't really, I haven't judged what's out there now. Well, I take that back. The one thing I'll say is that music is much shorter now, and I feel that that has an impact on our memory and the ability to retain it. Um, and a lot of it sounds quite the same. So, but I still listen, you know, especially with nieces and nephews that are, you know, 15 years old. Auntie Leslie, have you heard this? No. Okay, sit down and we listen. <laughs> so I feel that I have, I'm, I'm fortunate to ha have that lens of the younger generation saying, oh, we're going to listen to this or we're going to listen to that. Um, um, but I, I still find it important to be not in tune in that sense, but aware of it. Do you think music is a responsive art? A responsive art? In the sense that... Um, so I'm the same as you, I don't know a lot of very <laughs> super modern music, but if we think about the music of the women in the book, mm -hmm. they are singing about things that are happening to them. Um, mm. And in that sense, it's the music that maybe we don't understand a response for a younger generation. Yes, it definitely is. Um, and that's where I feel that get, getting older, I feel like my mother when she says, you'll understand when you get older. That's where I am now when it comes to that. Like, what is this about? Okay. But overall, the thread is still the same. Everyone's still singing about love. They're still singing about injustice or justice. They're still singing about being inspired and, and you know, doing well for yourself. That, those th themes never change. They're the very human. Yeah themes that we hear in music, aren't they? Yeah. All right, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Anybody else on the second row? Hi, great. Hi. Thank you. Um, uh, how does it uh, look through? I noticed that of the ladies that you've chosen in this mix is those who are still with us and those that have passed. Was that a conscious decision? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, in some cases, like the letter R, for example, there are a couple of artists I could have chosen, but Rihanna really spoke home because of her philanthropy, really. Um, the charities that she has at home, uh, that work is so important, and she's so actively talking about that work as well. So, like, for, you know, Rihanna, Lizzo, their music and their platform are one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Janet Jackson, uh, same thing. It was really critical to have those women, and also because, you know, for example, Queen Latifah, she was, is one of the first female rappers that made it big, and also went into acting and directing. Um, I wanted to show the complexity of what these women did as well, so it was important to tap into the women that are alive that have still put an impact on the music as well, so... Groundbreaking. I mean, they, they push a lot harder. 
Yes. Yeah. But, you know, the women who are no longer, like Aretha, um, Ella, their, mu their, their music is still relevant. You know, it's timeless. Um, and I think Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation album just made, what, 25 years or something? And I was watching on Instagram, she, on her account, she shared all these videos of people doing all the dances from that album, from globally. So it's still relevant. Um, I think the beauty of that as well is, you know, if you've got a, a young child reading that book and you can say, let's just hop on YouTube and listen yes. to this concert that she did last yeah. night, yeah. and then let's hop on YouTube and listen to this concert that Aretha Franklin did X 40 years, years ago. ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a beauty in that contemporary resonance mm -hmm. of, of both kind of living and, and uh, deceased artists. Yeah. Um, probably time for one more question. Over here. Was that a conscious choice? Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. Because um, a lot of black people in this country um, grew up listening to that Nina Simone song. Oh, that specific one. The, yeah, okay. That specific song was played at parties on oh. a regular basis. Oh, how and funny. I, I heard it and I thought, okay, because it's one of my favorite, which probably is my favorite Nina Simone song. Yeah. And it's because you, you pointed out too that. She played the piano and she's a classical pianist who went to Juilliard and, and people forget that. They um, completely do. She was an accomplished classical pianist. Yeah. So thank you for playing that. Oh, song. you're welcome. I love that song. I mean, you just can't help but do. Yeah, do. You <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing about Nina, there is a documentary, I think it's still out on Netflix, about her life. Yes, yes. And the moment when she makes her debut at Carnegie Hall and she says, I'm not happy that I'm making my debut at Carnegie Hall because I'm a jazz pianist and I've always wanted to make my debut as a classical pianist. That, I, I totally understood that. Not because as a performer, but you know, I've been on stages like Symphony Hall in Boston, for example, but as a, as a marketing director, not as a performer playing on stage. Um, and, and even here today, this is my Wigmore Hall debut, and, which is just so crazy to me. Um, and, I'm, and I'm talking about this incredible book that I, I just feel that all those experiences, you know, life doesn't, you might, you might have a vision of where you'd like it to go when you have those moments. Um, but I don't know if any of you remember the joy on Nina's face when she did that performance. She was luminous, you know? And I, and I feel that way. I feel that it's a real blessing to have an opportunity to make those debuts, regardless of wherever you are as a musician, um, because you're still using your art as a vessel to connect with people. So I'm just thrilled that all of you showed up here today at one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, to, to celebrate these women in this book. It's, it's, a real, it's a real honor and a pleasure. Um, as a final takeaway, I've got sure. one last question. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Which one of my relatives am I going to tap into <laughs> for this? Contact um, the ancestors. Yes, the ancestors are definitely there. Um, my maternal grandmother, I reference her a lot because I spent a little bit of my childhood with her, so um, she would always call me Dove, and she'd always say, you know, my Dove, do your best and leave the rest. And that to me was an, an essence of trust and of faith. Um, that, that was one piece of advice that always sticks with me, and then my, my parents, would always say, whatever you put your mind to do, do it with your best intention and trust that it will work out. So I feel like I've been very lucky to have such strong familial ties that support my ability to be the artist that I am. That's really beautiful. Before I let you go, just tell us about the book one last time. 
So this beautiful book, A is for Aretha. <laughs> I hope that for all of you that have purchased it today, that you walk away with thinking about how impactful music is on our lives, but also how impactful the women are that is behind the music, and that you share it with as many people as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, Leslie Kwan. Thank you. Thank you. My best friend. <laughs>